Pastor Varun and Pastor Da Mahaprasit would like to welcome you to the following message from New Hope International Church, Seattle, Washington. Here is Pastor Lau's dynamic teaching that will change your life with love, hope, and peace in Jesus Christ. Today, I would like to share the message that every time I read this message that I prepare myself and wanted to share, I cried. I just feel that this is the message for me. Actually, the message was really speaking to me more than anyone else. So if, if I cried again, please forgive me. Okay, the message is come home to God's plans for your life. Come, everyone say, come home. No, I'm standing here, those who listen to the CD. I'm standing here on December 25th, year 2005, on Christmas Day, in the Christmas Day service. And one of the symbols that seem to capture the Christmas spirit or the Christmas emotion is the word home, especially in America. I learned a lot of cultural things in this nation after I moved here. Home for the holidays. So many people go through much um, effort, much hassle, much um, expense to get home for Christmas. How many people agree with that? People drive, people get on the airplane. And when we talk about Christmas in America, usually people think about coming home and being together. And as you know, when home is right, is working right, home is a place of warmth, it's a place of security, it's a place of comfort, it's a place of acceptance and understanding, empathy, laughter, nurturing, forgiveness, healing, growth, and also encouragement and love and hope. Home, the word home is positive in the eyes of God. It's a place that you come back and you feel that you are there. You feel at home. You feel secure because somebody loved you there. And the Bible talks about home too. Moses had a prayer in Psalm chapter 90 verse 1. This is what Moses prayed. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. So in other words, when you come to know Jesus, when you give your life back to Jesus, you feel that you come back home. That's exactly what I felt in year 1981 when I accepted Jesus Christ. I remember I was driving in a street called Ekamai in Bangkok, Thailand. And I just accepted Christ only less than a week. While I was driving, I was listening to Christian music. In, it's, it's actually, it's English music at that time because a missionary gave the music to me, the, the tape to me. And it felt in my heart that I have come back home. My dad is in heaven. I felt, I felt so rejoicing. I feel so good that I come back home. And I know that in my, the house of my father, I will have security and love and protection and nurturing and, 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 and grace and favor and everything. Lord, all generations will come back to you. You are our home. Amen. How many people feel that way when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? You feel that you come back home again. That is true for every Christian. But God say we want to go further than that. Go further than just coming back home as a Christian. God said, when you come back home, I am your father, and I have a plan and a purpose for you. And that plan and purpose for you is this, that you all need to get involved. He doesn't want all, any one of us who are Christian to miss that purpose and miss his will. That is to send you out of his home, and look for people who wander around in the cold weather out there, in the dark world, and have not found their home yet. God wants to send all of us out to show the way to go back home. Amen. Amen. He wants us to be 
that finger and say, "This is the way to go back to your home." God said to you this morning, "I need you to go out and point the way for people who are wandering lost in this world, and they need God." In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 22, how long will you wander before you come home? Wow, what a scripture! How long these people wander before they come home? There are people in your neighborhoods, in your offices, in your workstation, in your school. There are families out there that are wandering around through life without. Security, without blessing of God, without direction, without purpose, without meaning, without forgiveness, and without the guarantee ticket to go to heaven, and they need to know Jesus. And God wants you to go out there and seek them and bring them back home. And that is the plan for His children in His church. He said, "I want to send you out into the world." And tell them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 say, "Go everywhere and announce the message of God's good news to one and to all." It's amazing. To one mean individually, and to all we try to get as much as we can. I want to encourage you one thing: that not only you will experience the thrill. The the excitement of seeing people come into the kingdom of God and come back home. When you do what I say today, when you do what God speak to you today, it will really revolutionize your Christian life. You will not be having a Christian uh, a boring Christian life anymore. I find this secret that in order to have an excitement in my Christian walk, I need to do what. God says here that is to go out and help people to come back home. You know what? If you can do that, I can guarantee your prayer life will be revolutionized. You know what? Why? Because when you start to reach out to the lost, you can have to depend on God more. You can have the list of name you pray for. I pray for Kun Molly's husband every single week. I pray for people. I have the list of name that I pray for. You can pray. You will. Get close to God. You'll be on your knees more for your loved ones that have not known Jesus. Your prayer life will increase. Will be revolutionized. Your worship will be revolutionized because you you realize that oh, you cannot do this without His help. So you're gonna cry out to God. You're gonna worship God and want the presence of God to come upon your life. Your reading the Bible will be rev- revolutionized. When you read the Bible, you will not just seek the abstract. Theological truth that decorate your brain anymore. A lot of Christians like to decorate your, their brain with the, theological abstract. No, when you begin to go and reach out to people, you start to study the Bible to know the answer for the lost, to know who God is. Because you cannot preach Jesus without knowing Him. You cannot tell people about Jesus without knowing who He is yourself. You begin to read the Bible as a love letter from God, and you say, "God, I want to know you. I want you to really become real to me. I want to not only that. I want to practice what you say, because my message will not come only from my mouth, but from my life. I want to be a walking Bible. So when people see me, they will see Jesus in me. They will see the Bible talking to them." Your reading of the Bible will be totally different, amen? amen. Your life will be ever changed if you can do what I say and I preach today. Then you won't seek more anointings because you know that no one can get saved by any man's ability. Amen. You need the anointing. You need the touch of God. You need the fire of God. You need the Holy Ghost. You need more of the Holy Ghost. Your life. Your Christian life will be totally revolutionized if you can just go out and help people to come back home. That's what I want to talk to you today. You know, many Christians are like this: they come back home and they lock their door and they sit on the lazy boy chair, and then 
put that back, put that legs up on the on the couch, eating popcorn and watch TV and lock the door. And that's why the life is so boring. I want to stir you up today. Get out of your lazy boy chair. Open the door. Go out in the dark world out there. Go out in the cold weather, looking for the lost who have been wandering around, and say, "Here, I show you the way to come back home." God wants you to come back home, brothers. God wants you to come back home, honey. Amen. God wants you to go out there to help them. People out there looking for hope, but they don't find hope. People out there looking for life, that they don't find life. Money cannot give them life. Money cannot give them hope. They need eternity. A lot, a lot of people out there are gonna be lost in eternity without God. They're gonna. Two days ago, my wife was talking to my son, Paul. Say that, son, you don't want to go to hell because there you're gonna be with the devil, and the devil was pretty mean. You don't want to live with some mean guy for eternity. Amen. You want to go to heaven with us, and then my wife say, uh, uh, put your hand above, above above the the fire, the stove, the you know we are cooking, and he asked him, is it hot? Yes, it's hot. And my wife say, that is worse in hell. That when you are there, it's not just only a little bit, but you're going to be burning for eternity. So choose Jesus. My wife talked to Paul like that. Amen. Amen. And when I say this, when I challenge you like this, you say, Pastor, I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not the church worker. I'm not a preacher. I don't have any theological name, a theological background. I cannot do this. I put I put money in the offering bag to hire you to do that. I put the off money in the offering bag so Billy Graham can do for me. It's not for me. I'm just a everyday ordinary Christian on earth here. I cannot do this. Today, I'm gonna exhort you that you can do it. You are an everyday ordinary Christian that you can go out and point the way back home. For people, before I tell you what you need to do, let me share with you about a man that I read in a book. And this man, his name is Bill. It's a true story. Bill was a financial consultant living in the suburb of Chicago. He loved was living in a kind of um, ranch house. He is not rich. He's not poor. He's a kind of so-so. In the middle class level, he came to know Jesus one day, and after that day, he was he felt so grateful to what Jesus did for him. He was having such a great attitude, and one day he died. And the story go on in this book that he has a his pastor set up a funeral ceremony for him, and when. The, the writer of the book walked into this funeral ceremony. He was so shocked because this man was not famous. He did not have any many letter behind his name, A M D P H D, uh, M D, whatever. No, no, nothing behind his name. He did not have any theological training. He was just an ordinary, nice guy, married with a woman named Millie, and just lived life with family. And one day he died. But in that way, in that not wedding, in that funeral ceremony, he saw hundreds of people pack into that room, and the pastor put a few microphones in the middle aisle and say, "Whoever in this room know that you will go to heaven for sure, and you go to heaven because of this man named Bill. He tell you about Jesus. Come out here and tell the story. In a few minutes, people lines up." Bunch of people, packed, line up to waiting to talk on the microphone. And the first person come up. The first person come up and tell the story about Bill in that funeral ceremony. This is the first story, and how Bill, an ordinary, everyday, simple man, can make a maximum impact on people's life. The first story. The man come out and say, "I know one story about Bill. One day he has to go to the business trip in Chicago, in the downtown Chicago. While he was walking on the street, a panhandler 
or a street person, a, a, a homeless person came to him with a pan and asked for money. Bill said, oh, I gonna, will not fill him, his stomach alone with food. I'm going to fill his soul with the good things of God. So Bill said, Can, his name is Robert, this man. Robert, could you come to have dinner with me? So he took him to the restaurant, feed him everything, and say, Robert, 4th of July is going to come up soon. I'm going to give you some money. Could you buy the, app, the train ticket and come to my house? And we will have good dinner on the July 4th together. So Bill was expecting Robert to show up that day. July 4th came. Bill went to the train station. The train came and went, but Robert didn't show up. By this time, when you heard the story, you may think that Bill would go home and just enjoy his July 4th by with his family. No. He got into his car. He went to downtown Chicago and went to bars, to bar, to bar on the street looking for Robert. And eventually, he found Robert sleeping on the park bench in the dirty cloth. Bill woke him up and said, Robert, come to my house. I picked you up today. So they, they went, went back home, had dinner, have a warm, you know, with the uh, fireplace. And then after that, Bill shared the gospel. Bill said like this, God created you in his image. You are valuable in his eyes. The world may think that you are not important because you live on the street, but in the eyes of God, you are precious. You were created in his image. You would like to be with God when you die? Would you like to be his child? And Robert said, yes. Robert invited Jesus into his life that day on the July 4th. And the teller of the story go on and say, a few days later, Robert passed away. He was saved at the right timing. And he has gone back to be with Jesus in his capital H-O-M-E home. Not the home on earth. Amen? Amen. After you listen to this story, I learned something about Bill that an everyday ordinary man can do to bring a maximum impact on people. Bill, walk a life that show tenacious, do I say it right? Tenacious love. Is that Jesus who has the tenacious love? Tenacious, never give up on people? Jesus had a tenacious love. He went out to people who are wandering around and did not know God. Our God is like that. Our God has a tenacious love. Bill didn't give up. Bill went into the city, looked from bar to bar to bar to look for this man, Robert. You know that God's love chases after us. God's love pursues us. God's love is so extravagant. He will go after us, go after us until we get saved. That is the love of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, But God so rich, everyone say rich, rich. is He in His mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great, wonderful, intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. He made us alive together in fellowship, in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him for. It is by grace that you are saved. Amen. God's love is so rich. He never give up on anyone. You know, when I... Read this story. I repented. I cried. I was crying in the car while we went out to pass track last week because I was reading this sermon in the car. I said, God, I'm sorry. I have given up praying for many people. 
I say they are hopeless people. In my eyes, I give up on reaching out to certain people, but Jesus never give up on people. Amen. He loved people. He never give up easily like us. He keep on going and pursuing people. My dear brother and sister, let us have teenagers love. Have you ever done that? Have you ever write off somebody name? Have you ever cross off some name from the, your prayer list and say, "Ah, oh, let him go to hell." I don't care. Send fire, burn him from heaven. Have you ever done that? Have you ever given up on your sheep, on the sheep of God that is in your care group? Have you ever given up on those somebody out there? Whose lifestyle was so out of whack, so immoral, so hostile, and so indifferent toward God, and you say hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. But God said to you today, "Don't write them off. Don't wipe out their name from your list. From your list, pursuing them. You know this is a very dangerous mentality in the church people." I heard one time people come to me, Pastor. Wow, I think you have a good life, huh? You are in the church. People love you. People care for you. Yeah, we have a good time in the church. But they out there in the office, they burn the air in blue because there's gossip. They watch pornography. They're bad people. They this and that and that. They and we are good. My dear brother and sister, if we have this mentality, we will not be able to do what Jesus did. Another word, the mentality called "they and we," is not "they and we." Amen. Amen. This is a church mentality. Sometimes that we label people out outside the church "they" and we label as "we," and we never want to reach out to them and say they are hopeless people. When I say like this, I don't mean that you need to be pushy. You don't need to be ob- obnoxious. You don't need to be forcing them and drag them to go to church. You just pray for them, love them, feed them, reach out to them without giving up, without writing them off. Point them toward back home in a gentle and loving way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you make a decision to give up on somebody, you are telling God that I make a choice for them to go to hell. I make a choice for them already. I don't care. No, no, no. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your unsafe loved ones. Don't give up on anybody that God put into your life. And in fact, we and they, in fact, God put you in that office to be the light and the salt to get them into the kingdom. Amen. God did not put you there by an accident. God put you there to be the salt and the light, to help them. Amen. Amen. So, I, I, as I'm talking right now, did God bring you the name that you have been erased from your list? Why don't you put that, those names back on the top of the list and start to pray again for them? Amen. Amen. Let's say at the same time. Teenagers love. love. I will never give up. I will never write anybody off. I will never erase any name off. I will keep praying for those people until they are saved. Amen. The second story that I heard about Bill, a woman named Mary, she stood up and came to the microphone, and she said, "I was married for 18 years. At the end of 18 years, my husband packed the bag and walked out." And I never saw him again. Once he walked out of my house, I was in distress. I did not have money to pay my bills because he earned a living. But I was a housewife. He left me with kids. I don't know what to do. But I heard about a consult, financial consultant named Bill in Chicago. So I make an appointment to see him. He and his wife took me to dinner in a restaurant. We were talking. He 
they invited us to go to church. And that Sunday, the pastor preached that, oh, Jesus is your real husband. If you lost your husband, Jesus wants to be your husband and will take care of you. She kind of feel like it. She's like, mm, good, this is a good message for me. <laughs> and they went out and have lunch after, breakfast, uh, after the uh, church service. After they went out, at the end of the lunch, they were departing. And Bill pulled his hand up and shook her hand. And why he, when his hand came out, he felt a paper on her hand. And she looked and said, a $100 bill. She gave her life to Jesus. And to serving God nowadays in her church. The story goes on about Bill then. He always have a air, one area of his wallet that he keep, keep either twenty or hundred dollars bill in that area. And every day when he woke up, he will pray to the Father in heaven, Father, today lead me to find somebody that need this dollar twenty hundred dollars bill. Yeah, he didn't meet those people every day, but once a while he will meet those who are in need, and then he pulled that cash. And put in the hand of those people. This is the lifestyle of Bill, an everyday ordinary person. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. She, he changed the hopeless woman into a hopeful woman. Hallelujah. The Bible says like this. This is what what Bill did. Exactly what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said that the second principle, not only that we have tenacious love, the second principle that we learn from this story of Mary, of Mary, how Bill helped her, is that we need to show love. We, make, we need to meet people's practical need in the name of Jesus. Everyone say, meeting, meeting. people's practical need in the name of Jesus. When the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, the word good in the Greek language, it doesn't mean the comparison between good and evil. The word good in the Greek language means attractive. Everyone say attractive. attractive. So in other words, Jesus tried to say to you in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 like this. I want you to go out and serve other people in the practical ways that will winsomely attract them toward me. Amen? Amen. Who? We need to do that. We need to go out and meet people's practical need. The practical need of our sister is a ride. Amen. Some people's practical need is finances. They're broke. They need money to pay bills. And we help them. In this Christmas season, why don't you look for the help you can go out and help people. And not, not only Christmas time, the whole year. Living a lifestyle of meeting people, practical need. So that people will know that they are not forgotten by God. God still remember them. And the follower of Jesus Christ come and meet their need for them. And help them. You may know some single mom in your neighborhood or in the church. And this single mom had to work two jobs to feed their kids, her kids. And you may give them her, give her a practical need. Honey, can I come and watch your kids on Saturday so you can go out and do shopping? Maybe you can go to that house and say, I will clean up your house for you so that today you can rest because you work two jobs. Pastor Da and Tammy went to an uh, elderly man and clean up his house a few times. They live in uh, Bur- uh, what you call Burian area. 
And this man said that I know so many people in the church, but no one came except the pastor of this church. Practical needs, helping people. Maybe around your neighborhood, you have a neighbor who are who are elderly. Their curtain that drapes and their blind came down, and they're living in isolation, and no one care about them. You may go and knock the door and say, "Mr. So and So, Mrs. So and So." I like to invite you for dinner, so that you will not be lonely anymore. Maybe the practical need is some family; they don't have money to buy gift for their kids during Christmas. You look for practical need, amen, and help them. The third story. The third story about Bill. Another person come up and say, "I'm a partner of Bill, working in the same company." Bill, at the last few days and few hours of his life, he was in the hospital. He had IV on. The doctor had to give him some sedation so that he would feel comfortable. Gave him a lot of medication, and Bill hated needles. How many people hate needles? I hate needles too. But Bill loved opportunities. Why he was lying in his bed in the hospital? He was sharing the gospel with the Bed next door, and then around midnight, this is in front of the eyes of his partner. The partner come and look after him uh, um, around at night time, so that the wife will go back to take care of the kids. So a, a, a nurse walk in named Sophie. Sophie walk into his bed, and Sophie say, "You know what you need? Uh, wh- what can I do for you?" And Bill, at the last few hours of his life on the death bed, he said to Sophie. Sophie, do you know where you're going after you die? Are you sure you go to heaven? And Sophie said, "No, I am not sure." Bill began to tell her the gospel at the last few hours of his life. So what we learn from Bill here is in the book of Colossians, chapter four, verse five: Make the most of your chances to tell others the good news. Be wise in all your conduct, uh, contacts with them. Everyone say, making, making. the most <coughs> out of opportunities <laughs> to point people toward home. <laughs> Amen. Toward God. So the first principle, what we learn is tenacious love. Don't give up. The second principle we learn from the life of Bill. Would it be nice if we die and we are in our funeral ceremony? A lot of people come and say something like this. Wow, it's powerful. Amen. The third principle is that making the most out of opportunities. Amen. Hallelujah. Opportunities come, and opportunities go, and may they may not come back. In order to be able to grab. Uh, to catch the opportunity, you have you need to have an open eyes, and you need to have a tender heart, and you need to have the ear listen to God. You open your eyes looking for opportunity, and your your ear listen to God, and your heart is tender to help people. And I want to tell you, sometimes opportunities can be split second. Maybe this. This holiday time, Christmas and New Year, you may have some old friend that you haven't met for years and years. Call you up at home and say, "Oh, Mr. So and So, or or maybe Jim, how are you doing? How 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 have your life been?" And you you have that split second. You say, "Oh yeah, my 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 daughter just got married, and oh we have a good time." And then you hang up the phone, and that opportunity is gone. Or you can say, Jim, oh, this year I have a great time. I find a good church. Oh, I learn more about God. I'm growing. God bless my business. It's so good. I like to invite you to come to my church too. Yeah. It's a split second opportunity. Maybe you go to eat in a restaurant. You put a tip on the on the table, and it's split opportunity that you can put the invitation card to your church. 
Maybe somebody email you from day spring. Is that day spring? I think day spring. Yeah, for the Christmas card. Is that right? Yes. Day spring. You don't know day spring? No. It's an email card thing. And then you can email back, and you put the scripture in there, and you bless them. It's a split opportunity. You know, sometimes to get that split opportunity, you need to be bold. You need to forget about your own reputation and say it. I remember when we have a rehearsal dinner for Tanida. Uh, Brendan family set up a very nice rehearsal dinner for us. As this is a family issue, family thing. So Da and I were sitting with her friend that we haven't met for five years from Bangkok. Pastor Da took the split opportunity, the split split second. She turned to me and said, go for it. <laughs> we were eating. So I turned around to these two ladies and said, I would like to share with you something. And I began to share the gospel. Actually, I need to take the bonus because I, I, in my flesh, I did not want them to reject me. But I just share the gospel and let them go and digest it. Amen. It's a split opportunity that you to take the most out of every opportunity that God gave to you. Did you take the risk sometime? Did you invite people to come to church? Did you have a chance to really do something in that opportunity to witness and to tell people about Christ? You know, after you listen to this story about Bill, you can see that how an ordinary, everyday man, simple man, can do extraordinary for God. Let's say at the same time, I am an ordinary person, but I can do extraordinary things for God. If I have a Tenacious love. I don't give up. And I will meet other people's practical need. I will show a tangible expression of God's grace to people. I will make every opportunity the best for God. I want to tell you right now, there's nothing that Bill did that you cannot do. Amen. You don't need to be a preacher. You can do all these things that I'm talking about. I want to end this sermon by telling you three practical ways how to do these three things. There are three words here at the end of this sermon. Stop. Look. And listen. Everyone say stop. stop. Look, Look. And listen. So in order to do these three things that I'm talking about, are you okay? Are you hungry? Okay, you can go on another few minutes. Is that right? The first thing we need to do, we must stop long enough for people to come into your focus. We are living in a fast-paced society. Oh, Christmas. Shopping, shopping, shopping. Oh, boo, 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 boo. Set up the Christmas tree. Oh, writing the card. Oh, you know, especially for me, I have to prepare two sermons. So a lot of very busy to do things. Go on and on and on. So we're too busy. But we never lock our eyes on another human being. That we can look into their eyes and see, you, um, you matter to God. Sometimes we need to stop. Have you stopped looking in the eyes of your wife sometime? Lock your eyes with her. <laughs> now you need to stop and look in the eyes of people out there. Get, put them into your focus and say, this person matters to God. They need God's grace. They need forgiveness. You know, the devil is so very, very wise, very cunning in America. They make all the Christians busy. Busy with ministry. Busy, 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 busy. To the point that you never have time to look at the heart, the eyes of the lost. Look at what Jesus did. Mark chapter 10, 49 to 51. At that time, Jesus was walking through the gate of the city of Jericho. And there's a lot of people out there. And look at what Jesus did. 
Jesus stopped in his tracks, called him over, called the blind beggar. They called him. It's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. Jesus said, "What can I do for you?" And the blind man said, "Rabbi, I want to see." Jesus stopped while he's walking. He stopped. And he say, "What do you want? Don't let the business of life stop you from stopping to look at the eyes of people." A preacher say like this: We must show a new generation of nervous, almost frantic people that speed and noise are evidence of weakness, not strength. Sometimes people want to run, 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 go fast. But never slow down to look at other people's need. We need to stop seeing, stop and see people as in individuals that they need God. Everyone say stop, stop. and focus. focus. Number two, look. Look at Mark chapter 10 verse 21. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. Oh, I love this scripture. He looked. I love him. He said, there is one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor and all your wealth will be heavenly wealth and come and follow me. We must stop and look. You know, the eyes is the window of the soul. When you look at the people's eyes, you can see the need inside. Jesus looked into the eyes of this rich young man and Jesus knew that he was bound and he needed the gospel. Unfortunately, this man rejected the gospel. He said, no, I don't want to follow you. I want my wealth, my money. We need to learn how to look into the eyes of people and see their need. People may be lonely. Maybe people may be full of fear. Maybe they need friends. They need help. If you never look into their eyes, Talking to them and looking into their eyes, you will never know their needs. This is one of the secrets I do in my practice. When the patient comes in, I look into their eyes and I talk. And I can read whatever is inside. So I can meet his, their need. There is one doctor that patient always ran away and come to me. And I don't want to mention the name. When this doctor interviewed the patient, he will, his eye will be on the computer and type, what is next? What is your symptom? He never look at the person's eyes. He's just typing his computer all, the, all along in his examination and history taking. This is a big mistake. You need to look at the people's eyes. Amen? So look. And I want to tell you, whatever you see inside that soul, loneliness, fear, lacking, sickness, Whatever, the true answer for every problem in that person's life is J-E-S-U-S. The answer for every problem in life is Jesus. Stop, look, and number three, listen. John chapter 10 verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me. Listen for the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. How to reach out to that person. You stop long enough, that person will come into your focus. Then you look into the person's eyes, lock eye together to see the need. And then you keep, you, you begin to pull out your antenna. Beep, beep. And listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. What an exciting journey to do this. Amen. Do, do I give you practical points here? To be an ordinary person that can do extraordinary for God. Amen. We sometimes are surrounded too much by noise, outer noise. You know, sometimes you get into the car, you begin to listen to 105.3. And then you listen to another rap music. And then you listen to on, and then you have uh, that one that on your ear. What you call? 
the tooth, the something, Bluetooth, and then people call you, and then you just click and oh, blah, 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 you talk, you noise, noise, noise. You never listen to God. God is so sound like quiet. God, you become deaf to God because all this sound around you. My dear brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to just shut off everything, shut off the music, shut off the Bluetooth, and just and shut off the TV too. All the program, and sometimes you just spend time with God reading the Bible and listen to God, and let God speak to you. That's why in the car, I sometimes I try to listen to God, and sometimes I listen to some sermon. Actually, I, I listened to one sermon; it was so convicting. I was repenting. God was speaking to me sometimes through the sermon, through the Bible, through the Scripture. Listen, Amen. Listen to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I know that Pastor Da is very good in this area. She listens a lot. She knows exactly what people need, and she will buy the right thing. She will call them the right time, you know, because she listens to the Holy Spirit. You get up in the morning, you pray, God, from today, every single day of my life, give me tenacious love that I will not give up on people easily. Lord, help me to meet people's practical needs. Lord, every single day, let me see the opportunities, and I will make the most out of it. And give me courage to take that opportunity in the split second to do something for you for the gospel. That I can take people out of hell and go back home to heaven. And ask God to give you some kind of slow down. Stop and lock your eyes with people. And you look into their eyes and listen to the Holy Spirit. From now on, I pray that our church will bring more souls into the kingdom of God. Next year, I pray that we will bring at least 1,000 souls into the kingdom of God. Not all of them may come, may come, will come to our church. This year, Already 386 souls. Oh, more than that, because I haven't counted yesterday. So it will be 389 souls. Yesterday, three people accepted Christ. Next year, we want to see 1,000 souls. If you do what I say today, I believe you're going to see 1,000 souls come into the kingdom of God next year. Let's set up the, the goal for year 2006. That you will bring at least one soul a month to God. Amen? Amen? Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Let's do the same thing. Have you given up on somebody already? Actually, after I read this sermon the third time, I was praying for your friend, uh, William and Tracy, your friend that didn't come back to church, I pray for them. God, I'm sorry I give up on them. I wipe their name out from my list. I'm going to keep praying for these people again. I stopped praying for my brother and sister in Thailand. I'm going to start to pray for them again. I gave up. I feel like maybe I waste my time. But I repented. Amen? We should not give up. Do you learn something today? Anyone in this room that have not come back home yet, have not become a child of God. This morning I want to invite you to come back home to meet God and to become a child of God. If you want to do that, I'd like to pray with you. Come to the altar here at the end of the service and I would like to pray with you. You may think that you know God, but you are not sure that you will, after you die, you will go to heaven. Let's make it sure today that you come back home for sure. How? By repenting of your sin and inviting Jesus Christ into your life today. Amen? How many people say, God, give me tenacious love? How many people say, I'm going to put out my sleep and will meet practical needs of people? Raise your hand. How many people say, God, I will take the most out of every make the most out of every opportunity that you give me. Raise your hand up. How many people say, if I 
die, I would like to be like Bill. That people will come up and say, I go to heaven because of him. How many people would want to do that? Oh, I want to be like Bill in this story. It's a true story. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we love you and we want to please you, Lord. We know that you, you, you came into the world, Jesus, to seek and to save which was lost. Therefore, we want to do the same thing, Father. We are going to go out of our own four wall door of the church and we're going to go and look for people who are still wandering around in the dark world. And we will not give up on them. We will continue to pray for them, Father. We will look for their physical, financial, and emotional needs. We will reach out to them, Father. We, love, we will love them the way you love them, Father. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We trust this message has ministered to you. If you would like more information about New Hope International Church or other teaching series, please contact us at 206-275-1042 or visit our website online at www.newhopeinternationalchurch.org. You may also write to us at the following address, New Hope International Church, 9170 Southeast 64th Street, Mercer Island, Washington, 98040. Thank you very much. 